Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for coming to our lecture. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rico Hale, who will be giving a lecture on Collards and Kale, a love story. And we are eager to hear that talk. What I really like about Rico's lectures is that he doesn't only bring information, uh, but he like engages the audience and he makes it so much, so much fun that you don't even realize that you're learning something. So <laughs> he's, he's very special and it's our privilege to have him, have him here. Uh, let's bow our heads for the opening prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being called your children. We thank you for the privilege that you take care of our health. You give us the best advice how to stay healthy and how to even boost our vitality and strength and endurance and clarity of mind. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to lead us um, and touch our hearts uh, in, during the lecture today. We, we ask you that you may also give us the information that we need for our life and give us the courage to conform to what we, what we know is the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How are you? It's a new year. And look at you all. You guys look good. I, wish, I just wish I could see more of you. You're so, you're so far back. I'm trying to see the, the white of your eyes. You know, if you sit way in the back, you're already guilty of trying to go to sleep. You do what you want, truly. You can sit wherever you like, but... Um, I don't bite anymore, <laughs> and uh, I think that we'll, you learn more if you're closer. I have no scientific evidence on that, but it's nice to say. How you doing? You look good. Now, who's uh, here for the first time? First timers. Hello, first timers. First timer, and another first timer. Now, you guys from the community, you heard about it, or do you attend this church? Your friend. You brought a friend. You get the, <laughs> you get a prize. You get a prize. And 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 you, my, you're a member. Well, we're glad when members are here as well. And you are. And you came from the community somewhere. Fant fantastic. Oh, it's so nice when friends invite friends. Well, um. Jose Luis, you're here. Jose Luis is here. He, was, he wasn't going to stay, but some pretty lady convinced him that it was a better idea for him to stay. Well, I'm excited about the topic today. It's a strange title, but um, I like, I personally have a love affair with collard greens. And I'll tell you, if this were a cooking class, I would, right here on the spot, I would cook you all the best collards and kale you've ever had. Let's hook it up. Let's hook it up. i tell you what. Here's a recipe in case we don't get, a, get around to that. It's just collards and kale, the two lovers, with ginger. Anybody like ginger? Ah, oh, ginger, anti-inflammatory, but a nice, wonderful seasoning. And then coconut milk. Coconut milk. I'm telling you, your mind would be blown. I was just in, um, in Oregon last weekend, and I did a cooking class. And, um, and there, was, there were several people in the class who said, oh, I don't like ginger. I don't like kale. And I don't like collards. I said, okay, fine. You can just taste it just a little bit. So I made this one lady. They just gave me a little, you know, a little sample size. And this one lady, she came, and she came, and she very reluctantly, she tried it, walked off. I turned my back. She was back in line again. <laughs> Four times. <laughs> so anyway, you want to try this recipe. Hello, friends in the back. So glad you're here. Um, for whatever reason, you're sitting in the back. That's your business. I'm not going to in any way mess with you about that. You're probably going to sneak out before it's over, or as I said, might take a nap. But hey, it's your prerogative. You're here, and we're just thankful for that. So, all right? All right. Um, thank you so much, Hannah, 
for inviting me again. This is my third time coming over here to Capitol Memorial and sharing. We talked about seeds the last time, I think. Before that, we talked about the origin of a plant-based diet. How many of you are interested in a plant-based diet? How many of you are already on a plant-based diet? Wow, progressive. Not that if you're not, you're not progressive, but join the band. Um, today I'm talking about collards and kale. It's a love story. It is a love story, and we will determine just how much of a love story it is. And I've already told you that I have my own personal thing with that dish, and if you ever want that recipe to try it out, please talk to me. Now, here's what we're going to do. We are going to do five things. How many things? Five things. We're going to look at how vegetables evolved, question mark. We're going to look at a biblical answer on green herbs, whether they truly did evolve or not. And then we're going to look at this idea that it was truly love at first sight. Then the love in collards and kale, the love in the collards and kale, and then it's more than just a provision. What's a provision? It's a food item, right? It's food, more than just food. Can you imagine that, that it might be more than just food? I think you'll be convinced that it's a little more, maybe even a lot more than just food. Come on in. We've been waiting for you. Welcome, welcome. I think your, your, your audience has tripled in size. Wonderful. So good to see that people are interested. For those of you who just walked in, we're talking about collards and kale and how it is a beautiful, wonderful love story. And we just kind of gave a roadmap for what we're going to cover. I'll go through these five things, and then I'll say thank you very much, and I'll say good afternoon to you. All right? So evolution. How many of you think that evolution is... Um, I don't want to get into a debate. It's not why I'm bringing it up. But I found some curious information about vegetables, fruits and vegetables and things like that. And they talked about how they have evolved. And, you know, in order for me to really look at this whole idea of the love story in it, I have to look at the different perspectives. And one of the perspectives is that these things all evolved over millions of years. And again, I'm not trying to get into that debate. I'm just letting you know that that's another perspective. And here is the perspective. Paleozoic period, that's 475 million years ago, they say that, um, you know, that they were starting to evolve, and then they started noticing that they were changing, you know, because, you know, you can look at fruits and vegetables, and they are different. They have changed. When you look at some of the steel paintings of things, you know, some of the artists from a few centuries ago, you saw or you could see that watermelon doesn't look the same anymore, right? Carrots weren't as pretty as they are now, according to some of the images you see. And uh, eggplant, they showed very, very different. But the question is, did they evolve or did we start to utilize different breeding and agricultural me methods? Philip would know that. He's a, he's a great farmer. Um, maybe he'll share some of why that might be it. Triassic and the Jurassic period, 20, 245 to 202 million years ago, continuing to change. And then they looked at the Cretaceous period, and you see the length of time. Ah, wow. Now, here's something that I looked at over this Paleozoic period. Fossilized spores suggest that land plants have existed for at least 475 million years. How do they even know that? I know they do carbon dating and different things like that, but 475 million years, that's, that's, a, that's a long time. And how do they pinpoint it so specifically? That, that, that right away kind of makes me a little suspicious. But anyway, early land plants reproduce sexually with um, flagellated swimming sperm, like the green algae in water, right, from which they evolved. That's what it says. In 2018, scientists reported that the earlier flowers began, we're talking about plants that actually first bud as flowers, yeah? Um, 
those were reported to began about 180 million years ago, 50 million years earlier than they thought earlier. Oh, wait a minute. They were off by a few million years. So the real question is, where do you want to land? What do you want to actually, what do you want to accept that somehow these things that we enjoy eating have somehow evolved over this long period of time and sort of changed along the way? Is that okay for you? I don't think so once you kind of go through this with me. Researchers, um, looking at that same period, researchers were not certain where and how flowers came into existence because it seems that many flowers that popped up in that period of time came from nowhere, this researcher said. And skipping down to the highlighted, studying fossil flowers, especially those from earlier geologic periods, concluded these Chinese researchers, um, is the only reliable way to get an answer to these questions. Is that okay with you? Is, does this feel like the only reliable way? Some of you are looking suspicious. Some of you are looking like you just had a heavy meal. <laughs> All right. So let's look at the biblical answer. I should let you know, and in, um, in addition to just being very, very passionate about talking about health, I'm also um, very passionate about looking at these things sort of from a biblical perspective. I love looking into the Bible. Uh, I don't make any excuses for that, but I need to let you know that I'm by trade a minister, but I love promoting health because I believe that it's closely connected to our physical health and our spiritual health is very, very closely connected. So I like to bring the two together, right? Is that all right? So as I go through, I'm kind of, you know, I have gave a little bit from the evolution side, and now I started looking, what does the Bible say? So we looked at last time, and I always bring this out because sometimes people don't know, and we certainly have more people this time. There have been three diets. What's always amazing to me is, and I've gone to different plant-based summits and things like that, and Hannah and I did one um, in New York last year, and I think we're doing another one coming up uh, this year, and I always am amazed, Philip, when sometimes people are talking about the plant-based diet, and they're talking about where it came from, whether it evolved, or is this something very new, and, and I say, you only have to go to Genesis 129, where we see that the original diet for man was plant-based. It included fruit, nuts, grains, and seeds, and... See, I thought you would say vegetables. Vegetables were there, but they weren't on the menu. Ah, now, this starts to give us a glimpse into this love affair. Stay with me. Okay, so three diets in the Bible. According to the biblical record, Genesis 129, you had the original diet, fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds. Then you have what I like to call the restoration diet. Why do I call it the restoration diet? Because collards and kale and broccoli were then added to the menu. They came after the original diet. Now, why do you think that they came after? What was it about them? Now, they were already there because According to Genesis 1.30, the animals ate them. It was something that the animals enjoyed, but it was there. But then something happened, and they became a part of the menu. A terrible thing happened in the garden, right? The couple that was there, as we know, is Adam and Eve. They actually ate something they weren't supposed to eat. And once they did, well... Everything changed. They were now subject to death. They were also subject to sickness and disease, something that was never supposed to happen. So now, just going by that, now that can be allegorical to you. That can be, you know, just a story, a nice fable, if you will, whatever the case may be. But can we look at it logically? In a scenario that was painted and described and characterized as being without flaw, perfect, a perfect environment. And yet, 
Now, all of a sudden, after this tragic thing happened where they ate from a tree they weren't supposed to, and what, the, what happened was they sort of missed the mark, if you will. Now, everything changes, and sickness comes in. Is it possible that collard greens and kale and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and different vegetables like that actually address the sicknesses or the diseases that they would be subject to? Have you considered this? Can you consider it with me now? Because we'll begin to see that there's something loving about this because the difference between evolution or an evolutionary period of time is that things are adapting or I like to just say they're getting better, right? No? Things are supposed to be when they are, there's adaptation and things get better. Things learn to sort of evolve and they will adapt to the environment so that things, so the, the species can continue. How many of you think, and I just have to ask this question, how many of you think or feel, believe that things in the world, plants, life, fruits and vegetables are getting better? Or are they getting worse? Why do you say that? Why would you say such a thing about plants and fruit and vegetables? How are they getting worse? Genetically modified GMO. Now we go into the store and we're looking for things that say non-GMO. What's the problem with that? Why don't we want things that are genetically modified? What is that anyway? You probably have someone who's going to come and talk about that. Oh my, did you hear that? Your body, she says, when something is genetically, meaning that they have somehow spliced a gene, added something into the seed, even to the extent of causing the seeds to have the inability to reproduce, where well, you have to keep getting new seeds. But she said that your body doesn't recognize the food itself, and therefore it rejects it, and causes all types of health issues. Did you know that? So now that tells me, from an evolution perspective, this shouldn't be happening. The things should be better. What if we looked at it from the biblical answer perspective, which is when it was made, it was designed to fix stuff, to heal things. Even as we're told that the leaves were for the healing of the nations, right? You've read that before? So this gives us a different perspective. I believe the better perspective in terms of what we have there in the garden. Did you have another comment? And you know what's so beautiful about that? And you'll see in just a few moments. Whatever the amount of time and whatever the change in the composition of those vegetables, if you can get them at least organic without being genetically modified, they still have the healing power that they were supposed to have from the very beginning. Now that's something that we should look at. And my question to you all is, does that sound like love's it's going to sound more and more like love versus just something that just evolved. It's going to sound like love. You know what I like to say? Now, my next lecture is going to be about food as information. And you kind of touched on it because there seems to be some sort of communication, at least one-way communication, but I would even go so far as to say there's a two-way communication between your body and the food. So there's something about food going in, and it doing something whereby your body responds to it at the level of your genes, your organs. This is what fascinates me. Hold on that, 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 that one comment. Let me just uh, skip a little hit, hit here just to clear up. So we've got the original diet. We've got the restoration diet. We talked about that a little bit. But now there's also the restoration diet. 
Now what is, I'm sorry, the, um, the emergency diet? What was the big emergency? Was there an emergency that I don't know about? The emergency was, according, again, just track with me just the biblical events. Believe them or not, but let's look at them logically, rationally, and see if they make sense. Is that okay? Just asking you to just track them with me logically, okay? So, as the story goes, there was a huge flood. A what? What was it? Big flood, right? Worldwide flood. Many people who have looked at the, um, the geological um, composition of the earth, they say, you know, these things were created by a huge flood. I believe it. Let's just say you can stay, stand wherever you are on that, wherever you like. Okay. So, big flood, all the vegetation destroyed. All the fruit, the seeds, everything is completely destroyed. So, we've got an emergency on our hands, don't we? There's no food. So, what do they do? Eat the meat. It's necessary. Survival. They're on a boat for a long time, according to the Genesis record. They're there for a long time, so they begin to eat the meat. They come to the land, and then they're supposed to go back to eating a regular diet. That would be healthier, but continue to eat meat. And then I showed last time that I was here that there is one of the most amazing longevity studies in the history of the world. It says that prior to the flood, okay, again, I wish Jama would get a hold of this one. Prior to the flood, for 10 generations, and a generation within the Bible record is 40 years. So 10 times 40 is how much? Where are my math people? That's 400 years. So it's a 400-year study that says, now whether you accept it as true or not, that's up to you, but let's just look at what the study tells us. What is, what's the data show? What is, the, what is the, the conclusion of this? 400 years before the flood, people were living supposedly an average of 917 years. 917 years. And they weren't primitive. They were quite smart. They were quite brilliant. You can learn to do a lot of things in 900 years. Would you agree? So 917 years, that's what the record says. And then after the flood, they began to eat the meat. And guess what happened? The lifespan was shortened down to 300 and some years. Yes. Mm, I, wish that was, I wish that was completely true. Abraham was 175 years old. And he was the youngest. You have to do a genealogical, you have to do a genealogy study. You have to go through and take everybody's age, and then you average them out. If you do that after the flood and everyone who lived, then you will see that there were 10 generations before the flood, 10 generations after the flood, and you can actually calculate the average age. And the age, based on that, even though God said 120 years, the average age was 317, 300 and something like that, 312. Just, to, just go through all the names, and it tells you how, how old each one of them was. And based on that, you'll get your average. But here's the point. The point is, 400 years before the flood, 900 and some years. 400 years after the flood, down to 300 some years. What does that tell us? Meat was introduced. introduced diet plays a role in lifespan. Now, what does the research say today? Now, Hannah is a researcher. She would tell you that people who are on a plant-based diet live 7 to 10 years longer than people who don't, who don't have a plant-based diet. So that's even what the science tells us today. It shortens your life, right? Now, let's continue. Now, we looked at the seed and the idea of the seed last time, and we saw that that was very significant. Why? Because the seed was the primary thing that God prescribed to man to eat. And we define what a seed is. Seeds are amazing. The research shows that if you eat a handful of seeds, raw, without any salt, without any sweetener, sugar, molasses, honey, or anything like that, if you eat those a handful every day, you extend your life by two and a half years. 
I like to have my nuts every day. Now, not a good idea if you are diabetic, because it's a fat, but it's a, even though it's a, a good fat, it's a fat nonetheless. Is that right? So you have to be careful. But whatever you do, it's only a handful, which is about a quarter cup, right? And I always like to make this distinction so that everyone's clear. When you eat a handful of nuts, it's not open fist. <laughs> and you pile on a whole lot of nuts. Here's, here's how you do it. You put it in your hand, closed fist, turned upside down. Anything that falls out, you don't eat. Make sense? Oh, your body will thank you. You don't need that much. Just a handful is all that you need. So, original diet, restoration diet, and then the emergency diet because it was an emergency. All right, continuing on here. So we see that a seed is life. Now this is important even as we look at, move down the path of looking at this love affair that we get from that which was introduced into the diet after this terrible thing that happened in the garden, according to the Genesis story. But a seed is life. And I always like to say, you know, there are things in a seed that we need. And here are things that are seeds, just to make sure that we're all clear. What are some of your seeds? Almonds, you like almonds? They used to say that was the king of nuts, I think walnuts, because of the omega-3s, they kind of say that that's a good brain nut and very good for you. What else? You, got, you guys don't seem to be up on your, 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 your nut categories. Chia seeds, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, okay, so here's what, here's what people seem to miss, and that is the fact that nuts are seeds, legumes or beans are seeds, Right? So nuts, beans, grains are seeds. And then hold on to your seeds. Seeds are seeds. Right? Why do I make that distinction and clarify that? I do it because here's the power, as we shared last time, this is kind of review. The power of it is inside that little tiny seed is so much genetic information to produce a whole nother tree. And the power and the nutrition within that seed, when you eat it, guess where it goes? And that wasn't a hard question, you all. <laughs> In you! Now watch this. Now there's this, there's this a powerful, listen to this very carefully. It's a powerful principle. And the principle is, whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. Whatever man sows, like sowing a seed, you'll also reap, right? Now, ask you the question. If I took an apple seed, this deals with sickness, why sickness comes and why we have a solution when we get to the love story that is the collards and kale and things like that. And my sister's pointed out the, the genetically modified foods that actually your body adversely reacts to. So if I take an apple seed, I put it in the soil, I water it. Will I get an apple tree in a week? A month? A year? He said, possibly, what kind of soil you got? Second question, before I answer that first one. When you actually begin to have a tree, will you get just one apple. Philip, help me out. You won't get, you'll get a harvest, right? So whatever you sow, you're going to get it. It won't come right away. And when you do get it, it won't just be one. That's the good news when you're actually eating that which is good. When you're eating that which is not good, the same principle applies. So in other words, if you're eating, let's say, I don't know, Snickers bars, Twinkies. I don't want to mess with your meat too much. But if you're eating junk food, right? And we're going to look at what is junk food in a second here. But if you're eating junk food, 
Will you get the results of that which goes into the body? Will you get it right away? Based on the principle that I just gave you, will you get it right away? No. Will you just get one thing happen? No. The principle remains the same. It's a powerful principle. Whatever you sow in your body, you're going to reap. And the reason why people are so sick is because they're sowing sickness. They're sowing it in their body. Someone said, that what you do in, three, in your 20s, and some of you will identify with this, that what you do in your 20s, you start to feel some aches and pains in your 30s. That what you start to feel a little aches and pains in your 30s, you start to get diagnosed with something in your 40s. And then by the time you're in your 50s, you're big time taking medication for that what you did in your 20s. And oftentimes, by the time you get in your 60s, a lot of times people die from that which started in their 20s. They didn't get it right away. And when it actually came a harvest, it was arthritis. It was diabetes. It was heart disease. Maybe it was even cancer. Does this sound like it makes sense to you? Make sense? So the seed is powerful. But what if we use it to our advantage? So you're covered if you're eating seeds. Extending your life two and a half years by eating raw seeds with nuts and seeds without any type of added things to it. Okay. So God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. All right. Now we see there that there was herbs, but they yielded seeds. There was a fruit tree which yielded fruit, and that fruit yielded seeds after its kind. So the key is the seed, right? And then this is just a quick journey of the seed and the plant, right? And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now that's right there in Genesis 1.12. And here in Genesis 1.30, I mentioned that it was for the beast of the field. I've given every green herb for meat. And when it says meat, that's just the old English way of saying food, right? I prefer the, new King, the King James, and that's what it says. But this one is really interesting. Psalm 104, verse 14. He calls the grass to grow for the cattle and the herb for the service, for the service of man. And what does that mean? The service of man. Well, after this bad thing happened in the garden, man had to actually work for his food. It wasn't as simple. He had to do things to it. He had to cook the food to get out the nutritional value. Now, that doesn't mean you can't eat a nice salad by itself, but there are things that are better cooked. There are things that are better raw, right? But man had to work, labor for the nutrition. Now, here's what's powerful to very powerful. Every food should have this. I mean, there are many other things, but I just broke it down to these six categories, right? And we began to see that when we eat, when we partake of these wonderful greens, they have all of them. Glucose, sh sugar, right? That's what your body is, is fueled by sugar, right? Good sugar. Protein, does kale and collards and all types of greens and fruits and vegetables have that? Yeah. How about fatty acids? Yeah, yeah, it does. Enzymes or vitamins, minerals, water. Right there is all the key things you need, right? Twinkies. I'm just going to keep using Twinkies as an example. Twinkies are amazing, but they're delicious. I don't eat them, but they're delicious. They last a really long time. Oh, years and years. They, people say that they could survive a, a, a nuclear bomb. I believe it. You know, the crazy thing is that when they stopped, they discontinued them for a while, a few years ago, and there was such a demand to bring them back, they brought them back onto the market. But I always have this saying, you know, they have a long shelf life, they do. But I like to say, the longer the food's shelf life, the shorter yours. Fiber, fiber. So you're right, fiber is, is absolutely essential for us to have fiber. Otherwise, you have problems without it. 
Okay. Now, we find that animals, again, no criticism for anyone's diet, if you happen to have a, a meat-based diet. I'm just showing you the distinction as we go down this path of this love affair, right? But you find that all of your plants that we just mentioned there, they're storehouses. They actually have everything you need packed inside of them, right? But animals, whether it's chickens or cows or fish, whatever they are, they are nutrient users. They need it. They don't have all those things in them. So therefore, they actually need to go where to get them? Out in the field, out in the garden. That's why the Bible says that they go, and that was, that was for, the service, for the service of man, but it was also for the animals, right? And even human beings, we are nutrient dependent. There are certain things our body cannot make, and we have to get them from, guess where? The garden. Okay. Looking at a couple studies here, this one, the Global Burden of Disease Study, I like to quote this one, identify the typical American diet as the primary cause of Americans' disabilities, disease and disabilities, right? Inadequate intake of vegetables, our fifth leading dietary, our fifth leading dietary risk factor. Now, has that changed, Hannah? Is it worse now? Or is it still around the fifth leading dietary risk factor? Still. So, imagine that. Just not eating. There was once one article that said, we're dying from what we're not eating because we're missing out on all the wonderful vitamins and minerals and things like that. In fact, you know that people will say, hey, you're a vegan, where do you get your, where do you get your protein, right? People always wonder that, but that's really not our big deficiency, is it? Our big deficiency is we don't get enough minerals, we don't eat enough roughage, we don't eat enough fiber, as you pointed out, we don't get enough of it, right? But here, we're being shown that this is an issue. I'm laying the groundwork to show you just how loving this relationship is. All right, love at first sight. And it was love at first sight. When God made man, you know he took him from the dust of the ground, according to the story. And that may sound a little wacky to a few of you. Man was taken from the dust of the ground, a little water, and you find that there are, there are fundamental elements that are found in the soil, right? Zinc and magnesium, and manganese, and, right? Any farmers, you're a farmer. I was just speaking somewhere else this morning. There were some farmers over here, but I'm not there anymore, but you're a farmer. When the soil is deficient and you're trying to grow a certain something, what do you do, Philip, with that soil? How do you get it up to the standard? So you say, for instance, I just bought a farm and I can't wait to grow blueberries. Oh, I'm looking forward to growing blueberries this summer. Can't wait, Hannah. You know why? Because I want to go by Whole Foods and go, nana, nana, nana. I'm not paying $10 for blueberries anymore. <laughs> right? But if I want to grow blueberries, there's a certain soil combination or composition that I need, don't I? And it may be more alkaline, more acidic. Right? And based on a soil sample, someone will tell me, you need more some mineral, right? Why? Because the human body, the same composition that you find in those fruits and vegetables, you'll find them in the human body. So there's a relationship between what's in the soil and what's in your food. You know what I like to say? There's the old adage, you are what you eat, right? Here's what I like to say. Eat what you are. How do you like that? And I just came off this amazing 18-day program where I just like did a cleanse, right? And when I say cleanse, I just was doing just juices and raw foods, and I feel amazing, right? Just, and I did it for 18 days. And then I got on a, a program and this is just what I do, I started looking at foods and what they're good for, right? 
what a collard's good for them. What's broccoli good for them? What are certain nuts good for them, right? What's ginger good for? And I decided that's what I want in my diet because when it goes in, I know what it's going to do. Make sense? Because that's how the body was designed, right? So look at this. The love story started in the garden. Oh, yeah, at first it was Adam and Eve. But then after they fell, there was another love story. And that love story, listen to me very carefully. How many of you like collard greens? Oh, good. Kale. Kale is king now. Everybody loves kale. Kale chips, kale this, kale that, right? Broccoli. You know what I like to say? For those who don't like them, you may not love collards or kale, but they sure do love you. Let that just kind of ring in your head a little bit. What do you mean by that? Oh, they love you so much. They go in and they do amazing things in your body. And it was, it was love at first bite. This is funny to me. I love the way, I can't wait to garden, Philip. I love the way that when you garden, when you go pick out something, there's this thing, you know? Like, for example, when you, I've never seen anyone go up to an animal and say, I'm going to eat you. Or even attempt to eat it, and it just stays there and says, do your best. They typically, you, whether it's chicken or whatever, they tend to, you come with a, a knife and a fork or a, some other thing like that, and, and you, you go, all right, I'm going to cut out a little piece right here. Will it stay there? Will it? Uh, they love you, but they want you to be, they want to be your pet, not your dinner. And they typically will run away. But have you ever noticed when you go up to a piece of collard, kale growing out of the ground. You go and reach for it, and it just says, take me, I'm yours. <laughs> Is that right? It doesn't try to run. It just says, go ahead, pluck off a piece, I'll grow back, <laughs> and I'll have some more for you in a week. <laughs> oh, you may not love it, but it's sure. Our bodies, I love this quotation, it's one of my favorite, because it just amazes me, this, this process, and it's referred to as a wonderful process, how our bodies are built up from the food we eat. Ah, this process transforms the food into blood and uses the blood to build up the very parts, parts of the body. This is amazing when you think about it. You eat that kale, you, oh, the process it goes through, the sacrifice. You're eating that kale with my collar, and you're, you are chewing it up well as you should, right? And then you digest it, it goes through that very violent process of digestion with hydrochloric acid and all the gastric juices, and it gets turned and churned, and before you know it, it's through the small intestines, and it's being absorbed as nutrients. <sighs> By all intents and purposes, it's dead. But then it comes back to life as blood. And it actually fuels your entire body, organs, delivering different nutrients to different needs in the body. And the crazy thing, the next time I'm here when I talk about information, food is information, the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, they know exactly where to go. They know where to go. They know what you need, and they deliver it to the area that is most needing. I think that's amazing. That's some pretty serious love. So when you eat kale, it comes blood. Eat a carrot, it comes blood. Eat a Twinkie, I don't know what happens to that. In a Harvard University study, it's always good to quote a Harvard study, right? Makes it really legitimate. A Harvard University study said, 
The research, the research has found that of all the foods associated with protection against chronic diseases, greens pack the greatest punch. How about that? Huh? Okay. The love in collards and kale. You know, they rate these things and they say that collards and vegetables like it are probably, probably the healthiest vegetable. High in A, C, and K. Good for the immune system. You want to have a strong immune system? Collards. Right? Great source of fiber. I'll keep referencing you because you pointed out that fiber and that need for fiber. Fights cancer. Now, wait a minute. Wait one minute. Collard greens fight cancer? Why is that? Now, I may have said this before in one of my other lectures, but it's worth, it bears repeating. It's anti-angiogenic. Are you looking at that? I'm sure you are. She's a fantastic researcher and a great lecturer. But when I learned this whole idea about angiogenesis, my mind was blown. How many of you know what that is? It's a big old word that you don't use at parties. Right? Angiogenesis is essentially, essentially it's the body's natural process of developing blood vessels to carry nutrients to organs. It's just blood vessels, right? I mean, for example, angiogenesis starts and your stem cells kick in. You get a scrape or a cut. Right away, the body's going to go to that area and it's going to bring bright red blood. Have you ever noticed that you get a cut and that thing starts to heal? It's bright red. You've got a process going on there. That's amazing, right? And angiogenesis is just your body's natural. Listen, listen to this. Because everything is on these legal law of the body type of scenarios. And the human body is under the law. It's under law whether we like it or not, right? Like you can't get around gravity, you can't get around this law. But it's a beautiful law in that it's always seeking to heal itself. So when a body is developing, even in the mother's womb, it starts to develop these blood vessels to actually bring nutrition and food sources to the organs as they develop. Make sense? That's all it is. And that's a law. If it's growing, feed it. If it's growing, whether it's a pancreas, whether it's a liver, whether it's kidneys, it needs a blood supply and it's going to start to grow. That's the law. Here's the problem. If you have a fibroid tumor or some other type of growth that shouldn't be growing, the body's follows the DNA law that says what? It's growing, therefore you need to feed it. That's why something so small that you can barely see in a microscope ends up being cancer the size of a grapefruit because it developed blood vessels and it fed it. Is that understandable? That's just angiogenesis, the natural process but it doesn't make a distinction between an organ that is needful in the body and something that might take your life. But guess what? Collard greens love you so much that they have been found to be anti-angiogenic. Huh? Is that evolution? You mean to tell me that there's a food that loves you so much that when it sees something that might take your life, it starts to starve the blood vessels, cuts them off so that the thing that's going to kill you doesn't grow? You better believe it. There's a Dr. William Lee who just wrote a book. He's done amazing research on anti-angiogenesis um, foods and angiogenesis in general. And he wrote this book called How to Eat to Beat Disease. But he's got an amazing TED Talk where he talks about this very thing. They're experimenting with drugs, of course. And I love this TED Talk because in his TED Talk, he actually goes through all this new drug therapy and people are like, whoa. And then he says, but you know what? If you want the best anti-angiogenic foods, just eat your fruits and vegetables, especially the green ones. Now, he didn't say this, but if I was there, I would have said it. Because they love you. They have a love affair with you. And they want to heal you. They're designed to do that. Does that make sense? 
So that's what you find in collard greens. You also find the same thing in kale, but it has something called sulforaphane. And there has been amazing studies about sulforaphane. Here are some of them. Look at this. Benefits of that love. Here's collards. Just take a look at your bones. Collards and kale, whatever it is. High in vitamin K. Ah, you saw me thirsting, didn't you? God bless you. You must be a pastor. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> None of you thought about it. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Collars and kale, they love your bones, right? High, high in vitamin K. I think in collars, I think I saw something where they actually produce more calcium in just those greens than like some of the things that you think produce more calcium. They are excellent for building up your bones. So they love your bones. They love your skin. They did one study and it showed that that it was an amazing study. I think Dr. Michael Greger, he pointed it out. He talked about how, you know, they gave collards and kale and different greens to, you know, high in chlorophyll, sulforaphane, and different, um, of course, vitamin A, collagen. You'll find those in there, and it's good for your skin and your hair, right? And they, they showed that people were more interested in crow's feet than they were at fighting cancer, <laughs> right? But, hey, you know, vanity is is the thing of the day, right? So it's good for your, your skin and your hair. Good for your pancreas. Actually helps to level those blood sugar, right? That blood sugar. So eating those every day will help with that. I like to mix them and have a little quinoa. Anybody like quinoa? Yes, yes. Quinoa is wonderful. So it has all of your essential um, amino acids, and it's a complete protein. That's what I love about it. Also good for your blood sugars doesn't cause them to, you know, raise. Good for your liver. They're good detoxers. Your liver is responsible for detoxing the body. Well, this helps you out when you eat them. So it loves your liver. Loves your gut. Good fiber, right? And fiber is a wonderful prebiotic, right? Um, so loves your gut. You have a healthy gut, and there's some studies about that. Loves your heart. Keeps your heart healthy. I've given thee broccoli. Look at this broccoli study. University of Chicago, Harvard, U.S. Institutes of Health. And they looked at all these different types of diseases. And, you know, broccoli, as we get ready to wrap this up, broccoli is also in the same family of these. It has the, you know, the sulforaphane, chlorophyll, right? Um, it falls under the category of uh, cruciferous vegetables, Yeah. Um, great raw or steamed. But notice, non-Hopkins lymphoma, reduction by 40%, lung cancer, 28%, breast cancer, 17%, ovarian cancer, 33%, esophageal cancer, 31%, prostate cancer. Men, 59% reduction, right? As they looked at people who were taking in more broccoli and these cruciferous vegetables, all right? Melanoma cancer, skin cancer, 28%. So what do you see in all those numbers of how it helps us to fight? Does that sound like love to you or evolution? It sounds like love, doesn't it? Here's another study, cruciferous vegetables and cancer. Institute of Food Research in Norwich, that's the United Kingdom. Effects of cancer cells when exposed to the bioactive sulforaphane, as I was mentioning to you, right? Find out in cruciferous vegetables showed profound epigenetic changes to the DNA. Epigenetic, that's something that's eh, it's not a new study, but it, it really looks at, how many of you understand epigenetics? I'm not trying to give a science lesson here, but you know, the whole idea of your, your, your genes um, basically will react to what basically you do, the environment um, that you, you have in it. If you eat a certain way, it can trigger or turn on certain genes or turn them off. So it's kind of above your normal gene process where your body is going to react to how you are you know, treating it. So here, they saw that there was epigenetic changes in the DNA. So furfane reduced by half the amount of cancerous activity in the genes in the cancer. So that sounds like love. Another study looked at epigenetic increase in the activity of tumor suppressors, things that actually suppress 
the cancerous genes in the body. Again, do you hear the love in that? Collars and kale. By the way, the, if you haven't gotten the point just yet, the collars and kale, the love story, is how much they love you. You got that, though, didn't you? Amen. More than just a provision. Now, if they're not doing the job, they can always reach out to good old cousin cabbage. Cousin, anybody like cabbage? I like the purple ones in my salad. Makes it nice and colorful, right? Get some purple in there. And you know, you find that the darker your vegetable, the more nutritious it is, right? So always get that nice color in your salad. Ah, you'll be doing good. So, cousin cabbage. Why do I go here to this whole idea of cabbage? Because I like the whole, just the makeup of cabbage, how it looks, you know? How it it's a cruciferous vegetable. And here, here's my spiritual conclusion of the great love. Are you ready for this? You ready? You don't seem ready. Are you ready? Okay, all right. Now, they call them cruciferous vegetables for a reason. Anybody know the reason why they call them cruciferous vegetables? You say, what? What about a cross? It's, it grows in the form of a cross. Yeah, it does have four sides, right? Basically, it goes that way, that way, that way. But really, it's the flower, isn't it, that actually blooms in the form of a cross. So in that, you hear the word crucify, right? And all of your broccoli, your kale, they're all cruciferous vegetables. And the sort of tag name for them is, or the meaning of cruciferous, how they arrived at that is, Cross bearing. Look it up. I couldn't believe it. Cross bearing. They're cross bearing vegetables. That's how they've identified them. Oh, please don't take my word for it. Look it up. And you will find that these vegetables are likened to the cross, bearing the cross. That may be very well true, but the name, so are you saying that cross-bearing has nothing to do as it, you look at the name? I am fully in support of that wonderful scientific answer, but the bottom line is, when you look it up, please tell me if it doesn't say cross-bearing, and not in the sense that it has been cross-breeded. Cross-bearing is what you'll find in any place you look it up, because from the very beginning, and here's why it's deeply, deeply spiritual, they came after sin. They came after there was a problem in the garden, and if nothing else proves that it addresses the deeper spiritual issue that would be done by a cross or at a cross, just look at the physical remedy, the fact that it heals and helps you fight diseases of all sorts, including cancer, according to the research. Is that clear? And this is why I say, the collards, the kale, and any of the cruciferous vegetables. Really, you can look, lump them all in. They indeed have a love affair with you. And that's why the cabbage and the cross are beautiful to me. Thank you so much for your attention and your time.